turn it up, it won't be so good. <laughs> well, we're live now. Tex, appreciate you coming on here, buddy. Of course, thank um, you. Um, absolutely, a pleasure to have you on, man. So, one thing I really love is first big show I got to go to you is like the headliner. So it's pretty cool to get you on here. Which one was that? It was a, uh, I think it was a Gamblers down in Florida. Oh yeah. You want to? Kevin. Yeah, yeah. There's one hell of a fight. Speaking of uh, matches, you just had one. Yes, I did. Congratulations. Thank you. So let's talk about um, going into that match, uh, preparing for it. What was that like? Uh, you know, I'd fought Arnaldo before at Nogi Pans. And uh, so one of the things that I know that about me, that if I want to do a rematch, if somebody wants a rematch with me, I want to do better than the first time. And uh, I think, you know, I think people, they already know what I'm going for normally. So I think I switched it completely up on him. And uh, that really, really caught him off guard and made him really uneasy in the beginning. It's uh, a lot of guys that watched the fight were saying he was just shook from the very beginning because I wasn't, honestly, I wasn't attacking his legs. I was letting him set himself up into my guard and see what he wanted. And then, um, I, I got the two on one grip and then I got the cross the uh, across to the other far side shoulder where he couldn't get his arm back. He kind of yanked it out a little bit, and that's when I decided to um he decided to cross his arms to defend and then I went to the razor arm lock and lock up the triangle. So um I don't know which one tapped him, if it was the arm bar or the triangle, but it he was in two submissions regardless. So um there was no getting out at that point. Oh, man, it looked beautiful. And so I've got a question because you mentioned attacking the legs. Do you feel like where you're primarily – or I feel like you're primarily known as a leg dude? You know, you like to go for leg locks. Do you feel like that gives you an advantage going to matches and you're like, they think I'm going to go for the legs, I can switch it up, and I'm not expect it? it? It does only if I do it properly. It does if – I mean, if I do it like I did that night, yes. I mean, if, if the guys – normally, though, sometimes – I, what I'll do is, is I'll, I'll run my head into a brick wall and get frustrated. And, but, uh, it seems to me that, uh, I'm in a different place with my mind and, uh, going down to fight sports and training. I went down there for a week training with the guys down there and, uh, playing with their game and going, okay, well, nobody wants to get leg locked by me. So they're just going to stall or run away or do this kind of game to not get leg locked. And it's like, well, then what do we do? It's like, okay, it's triangles, arm bars again, close guard. I think Gordon went back to him also. I think Gordon also had to go back to him kind of with Kyle Baum. He, he did the same thing, uh, arm bar triangle set up. So um, I think it's just one of those things where, you know, the match, is, the match is living the whole time, you know. So you have to uh, you have to figure out what, you, what you're going to do the whole time. You have to keep reevaluating until you get what you want. I got you. Well, man, it, it was a beautiful finish. I love watching it. So, I guess to actually get us started in our topics today, do you care to kind of explain what your journey has been like and what you got started in jiu-jitsu doing? Uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, though, I didn't start in jiu-jitsu. It was funny. I started at a, uh, I started at like a, a knuckle-up gym down the road from my house, and it was, uh, I started with cardio kickboxing. And then I started doing Muay Thai and fighting Muay Thai fights. And uh, then we moved to MMA because I had a wrestling background. And I did MMA for a while, fought for Bellator, had the fastest submission in Bellator history for a little bit. And uh, I just got tired of, like, the brain damage and concussions and seeing, like, the way that they treat fighters. Um, I think promoters are some of the worst humans in the world. Uh they they don't share the wealth and that's fine kind of but also it's not right and so i i kind of you know took a step back and i was like i'm just gonna I'm gonna move to new york and i'm gonna do strictly jujitsu that's uh i met marillo and unity and that's what they were doing was like everybody wanted to be a world champion in jujitsu and i was like well damn if everybody else wants to be a world champion then it's gonna be easier for me to do it you know and uh, they, he took me to a whole new level of uh, jujitsu, uh, being up there with those guys, for sure. That's awesome, dude. So, um, you mentioned that you did kickboxing, and so I read that you did MMA before you even messed with jujitsu. 
Can you talk about some of the pros and cons with that? Of of doing MMA? Yeah, all doing it before you worked on like primarily ground game. Uh, doing MMA. Isn't a lot of why I was doing MMA I found this like later on in life is I was using MMA to pay for my trips to go to California as just like able to do uh uh my first actual I it was uh Pan Am and I got third did Worlds got third at that and then I did or that put a Pan Am one year and got second blue but I was still like not like breaking through in jujitsu because I was still doing MMA. So, you know, you don't see very many MMA guys doing very well in jujitsu. They do okay, but none of them are winning world titles. You know, they're, right. they're not winning black belt worlds most of the time. You know, I don't know. Can you name one MMA star that's won a black belt? Exactly. So it, it's such a distraction from jujitsu and, I feel like you get away with a lot more in MMA because you get to punch people in the face, you know? So, and my record was heavily lopsided with, like, most of my, most of my fights ended in the first round. And I thought it was exciting, but I don't think that the jiu-jitsu or the MMA community wanted, you know? They want a competitive I was more of a, I'm Hard. I'm gonna get close enough. I'm not really gonna take you down, but I want to close bar. And I don't think it was accepted very well back then. You know, I was told so many times that, you know, I get a back in the guard pool. I feel comfortable doing. That. You know, that's one of those things where like you have to tell people as the coach, they're like, well, you have to get on. In your career, you're gonna be very uncomfortable. You can't. Uh, you can't stick. I'm sorry, Tex, you cut out there for a little bit. Can you repeat what you said right towards yeah. the end? Yeah, I was just saying that, you know, I think that one of the things that you have to do to make these great leaps in life is to get uncomfortable and get comfortable with being uncomfortable so you can become better. Absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. Um, for you, out of curiosity, what's been the most uncomfortable part as far as, like, your training and stuff? Like, for you, what's the hardest part? Uh, ah, uh, mental, mental, mental stuff. Uh, physical things are easier to deal with injuries and stuff like that. It's normally the mental part of like feeling like a failure and not, you know, feeling like I'm not good enough sometimes. But, uh, yeah, it's just one of those things that you, I, I deal with. I think it's just a, a mental health issue. Um, like nothing will ever satisfy what I'm, what I'm wanting. So I'll always want something better. And then it's also, uh, you know, even do even when you get to number one, there's only one way to go once you get there. You know, you can only go down from number one, and it sucks. But it's like once you get there, you know, you have to deal with the mental stuff of, you know, of course I was never number one, but when I bit Felipe Pena, and then I went and lost to, um, Kynon, I was number two, and like the whole time I was like, well. You know, I wasn't getting the match offer for number one. I wasn't getting the match offer for number one. And I was like, well, where do I go from here? And it was only down, you know, like at that point. And uh, I went through, you know, I went through a lot, you know, with the shit that happened in New York. And uh, that, that played a big role in a lot, of, uh, a lot of my downfall in the rankings and stuff, I feel like, mentally and everything. So that was, that was a huge thing. Uh, I don't think people, you know, I don't talk about it because it, it's just, it's sad that somebody would do that to somebody else, you know? Right. You know, so. Well, man, so it's an interesting aspect. I've never heard it quite put like that. So for you, what's been the best way to combat that feeling? Um, <laughs> I just, I just, I just make myself go to, I just make myself go to training, you know, no matter how depressed I am, no matter how bad I feel, I make myself go and at least I know for that part of the day, it's, it's, it's going to take some, of, it'll take some of that day away. And, uh, just showing up every day is, is one of the keys to becoming good. Um, 
before before training at Unity, I would take a lot of days off just because I don't know why. You know, like I feel like a lot of people take days off and they're like, "Oh man, my my knee hurts," and I'm like. Yeah, but does it need surgery? And they're like, oh, I think I can just ice it. I'm like, well, if you can just ice it, you can fucking train. Like, don't give me True. this. Right, you know, like, uh, and there's like, I, I hear this from people and then they're like, well, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna be a world champion. I'm like, well, I don't, I've trained with world champions. This isn't how they act. And this is, I'm like, I'm not going to discredit what you're saying, but I can tell you it's probably not going to work. Like, it's a, it's a good, no, it's probably not going to work though. Oh, well, and it's, I'm not picking on anybody, but man, it's funny when you got people saying they want to be world champions and they're telling black belt, well, I, I hear what you're telling me, man, but I don't I think I can do without, like, you know, like they try to like swerve right. around the black belt device. It's like, it's not going to work for you, dude. Right. You know, you ask for my opinion. This is why I tell people when they ask for my opinion, I'm like, just wait. Like if you ask, if I give it to you and you don't do or like, acknowledge it as like verbatim like as like validate it like then i'm just never going to give you advice anymore I, i'm not going to waste my time with you i don't have time to waste on people who won't take advice so yeah i mean there's tons of people tons of kids out there they want to do this and it's like guys you need to go to the gyms that are winning world titles and go there and guess what you're going to be the you're going to be the nail you're going to get the shit out of you every day and guess what okay you know just keep coming back and then one day you might actually become the hammer as they say so cliche and you guys you might win something and then of course then the professor notices you and then you start getting more time with the professor you know and then stuff like that i mean is that how it always should be no but when you've got a team with 500 or more members guess what there's not enough oh, yeah. for everybody you know so if you're at an if you're at a world class gym, they're gonna have a lot of members. You're gonna have your competitors. You're gonna have your hobbyists, and then you're gonna have your in betweens. They're like, you know, the good masters guys that are like, you know, I compete masters, but I don't, you know, I don't care about, you know, I I, I have other dreams, you know. So yeah, if you go to those gyms, you're you're gonna have to find your place. Hundred percent. I feel like that falls into the give your place either. Right, and I also feel like that falls into the whole you become a product of your environment type thing. Right, it does. You know, like, you want to be a world champion, you need to train with people who have either been a world champion or coached people to world titles. There are other there are people who have never won world titles, but they can coach people to world titles. So if you're not in those atmospheres and you think, like, I, I don't care if you think your gym's the greatest family in the world, you know, that doesn't matter. I mean, if that's what you want, then great. But then don't get disappointed with the results you're getting. If you're not willing to leave, you know, there's this loyalty problem that people have where they're like, well, I'm just loyal to this. And I'm like, well, then you're just loyal to sucking and that's your problem. And I don't really need to talk to you anymore. Like I'll go somewhere else. I'll go here. I'll fly to California. I'll fly to New York. I've moved my whole life for this sport. And, uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, if you're not ready to make those sacrifices in life, then don't, don't do this sport and don't say you want to be a world champion, you know? 100%. And so, man, I had read, you know, obviously you mentioned you wrestled and I've read that you uh, did football. Do yeah. you feel like your athleticism prior to jiu-jitsu and MMA, all that stuff, do you feel like that played a role in you, like, progressing? It had to, yeah. I mean, I was – I was, I was, I'm, 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 pretty, I'm pretty strong. Like, I'm normally stronger than people. I mean, probably not as strong as your husband, Joe, but he's a cold. Oh, no. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I can – because I was pretty strong in high school, and uh, I think it helped a lot. So, uh, yeah, it helps. It helps being an athlete. Uh, this this crap of uh, strength doesn't matter is it's not true. I mean, when I fought kind on the last time, I I hadn't felt anything that strong. You know, it was it really. Was, yeah, it was insane. I don't know who, what don't care what he's on. But, you know, it's good for him. But, uh, bro, 
Like, I was like, this is, I'm trying to like, I was trying to get my back to the mat and he's slamming my shoulder into the other side. Like, not even just place me over there. Like, like <laughs> getting whiplash getting thrown to the side. I'm like, Man, what? <laughs> well, you know, you mentioned him, you know, fleeing the other side. Um, Let's talk about the difference between being a physical competitor and a aggressive competitor. Because when I think of physical, I think of like, you know, you, Wagner Rocha, those type of competitors. But when I think of aggressive, I think of like Pal Harris. <laughs> oh, so aggressive would be like bad. And then, and then, uh, what's the other one? Physical. Physical. So physical and aggressive. Um, yeah, I think, I think we're in, we're in a new, we're in a new spot right now with that in jujitsu. There's a lot of, uh, so we just, uh, I just got back from two shows in, in, in Miami and, uh, it was quite a shit show. You know, people were acting very disrespectful, uh, yelling curse words at each other, getting into fights. I think somebody got jumped. And, oh, hell. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Um, I seen Seth's post about it, but I wasn't sure what all went down. I stayed out of it. Um, unless I need to, or somebody's like physically like harming me or my family members, like my teammates. Like, I didn't see anything happen. It was more like just jawing back and forth. But uh, this this crap of, of course, you know, I I, I technically hit William Packett in a match, which was completely accidental. And uh, but still, I'm at fault. I'm the bad guy. Got it. But this shit of like hitting people, smacking each other during matches. You know, it's if it's an accidental hit, like you can tell, but like after two or three hits and slaps, it's like, oh, yeah, man, like I, I just like, dude, like, let's just do this anymore. Let's go to a parking lot. Let's just either have a mutual combat or let's call up bare knuckle boxing in Florida and like, let's set up a match. Let's, let's fight. Like, what is this crap? You know, and I feel like, I feel like it's getting really disrespectful nowadays. And uh, I don't know why, and I'm not. I'm not happy with it. I'm not happy with the way the the way that people acted in Miami. And uh, yeah, I, I'm very sad to see that that happened. Actually, regardless if they are on my team or not, um, everybody uh, acted pretty pretty disrespectful. And uh, you know, it's one of those things where, like, now we're at the point where you know everybody. We want to, here's the thing, and I've said this, is are we doing a martial art or are we doing a professional sport? Because if you've seen some of the things that people do in the NFL football to each other, right? And then you go, well, the things that people do in jiu-jitsu really aren't that bad. Like, technically, like, just punching somebody in the face is like, yeah, that's an ejection, but nobody <laughs> That's not a big deal. But now we're getting to this point in – how do we make jujitsu more exciting? How do, how do we do it? You know? Um, and I think that's where we're at now. And I think that's where everybody's going is, uh, is getting more aggressive, you know, or aggressive or, uh, what was the other one? Uh, physical, physical. We're getting more physical. I feel like physical press are, um, like neither one of them is worse than the other. I mean, to me, I just feel like the respect needs to be had, or we're we're gonna we're gonna be throwing punches pretty soon at at events. And uh, I feel like one of the problems with one of the problems with Miami was is there's egos, there's uh, obvious, you know, there's a hometown team, regardless of whoever thinks Miami belongs to Miami belongs to fight sports, you know that. The, you come down there and be like, oh, we're, we have a gym in Miami. It's like, yeah, but like nobody, nobody cares. Like you're still like, Fight Force has over 500 members. Like you're not really like, we own that area. And most of your people come to train with us when we're doing pro sessions and stuff like that, you know? So it's one of those things where it's like, it's, it's kind of like it they're bigger than everybody else. So it's kind of like they'll poke, like everybody wants to poke it, like fight sports. And it's like, that's just a bad idea. Right. But, you know, also like we have to take our own, you know, and, and not do back to the people, you know, cyborg's such a nice human. 
such a good person, you know, that he would never want to talk bad about somebody from my understanding. So, I mean, it's one of those things where like, where teams try and fight us and it's like, that's just a bad idea. Like you're not going to win this. Like, it's just not a good idea. 100%. And so like, do you feel like um, when some of these stuff, like some of the stuff happens, you know, like people hitting each other during matches or, you know, stuff like that. Do you think that there's a possibility that a competitor might go into a match with malicious intent, or do you think it just happens in the heat of the moment type deal? I, that's that's a good question. Yeah, no, I don't know. Uh, I think some people do it maliciously, and they know they're doing it, and they need to be DQ'd. You know, they they do. Um, it's so we'll talk about my situation because I did it, and I'll own it. Like when I hit tack it. It wasn't hard enough for anybody to go, oh, wow, that was a fucking hit. It was kind of like, oh, fuck, that wasn't like a collar tie. That was kind of like <laughs> a book or something. But tack, it's fine. Like, it really wasn't that hard. Like, I really didn't hit him that hard. My hand wasn't even fully closed. So I think it went, oh, well, you know, attack, it goes, no, let's keep going, you know. But again, like I see people fighting and they're slapping each other like back and forth. And yeah. Like, All right, guys, DQ them both. Just do it. Just start getting like people need to start getting DQ. You know, uh, Mike Cipriani talked about this on a gambler's post. He's like, dude, if you guys are going to start slapping each other, you guys need to get DQ. And, you know, we need to fight after or whatever. He's like, but this this crap of disrespecting the sport or the martial art, like people are doing just people that need to get DQ'd you know just let it happen I like I said I wouldn't have been surprised if I would have gotten DQ'd when I did what I did nope. so uh sorry I had a call come in um You're so, good. <laughs> yeah I, I I think people should need to be getting DQ'd I think we need to take a stand against it and uh you know we can't let this happen we can't let it progress and you know the problem with it is, is violence only gets more violence True. until, until what we're in a war until we're fighting each other, like team versus team, like actually like gang wars, which is, you know, I think Gordon touched on this is where like fucking like the Brazilians started doing, like they were over in Brazil. Like this is our turf. You can't touch our turf. And then they go over, fight this team. And it's like, okay, well, you know, that's just that's that's like uh, that's primal. I mean, it, which is good, but it's also bad because it's just wh where where does it end? Where do we stop? You know, right? When you bring that up, so I'm pretty sure I, I think it might have been on Gordon's post actually, where he said that they would storm each other's gyms and just kick the hell out of each other's instructors. And at that point, okay, you're screwing up your own training sessions for that. And it's like, do you really want to escalate that far? I do not need it. So, speaking on, you know, the aggression, that type of stuff, let's go into the mentality. Do you feel like what goes – because, you know, I've seen you mentally break opponents before actually getting them physically, or that's yeah. what it looks like when they compete. What do you feel like goes into that? Uh, so, I uh, – there's this, this, this video with Mike Tyson, The Art of Intimidation. And then I've also read this book. The things I really like to do to opponents is always come up and be very respectful to them and everybody in their team to let them know that I'm not afraid. And I, this is my area. Not like a turn. You're welcome here. You can't see me. I didn't come to see you. Oh, yeah. And then also, People have watched the bat breaking video. I mean, I remember I rolling with Josh Hinger at Atos and I put a straight ankle lock and he tapped and he's like, dude, all I could start seeing was that bat breaking. And I was like, oh, you know, <laughs> you know, so I'm pretty sure people have like these psychological things. Like if you let yourself mind fuck yourself, like if you sat down and you watch my videos and you watch the injuries that I've had happen to other people that I've done. And you probably go, oh, fuck, I don't want my knee ripped out. Oh, fuck, I don't want my leg broken. It's like, it's a simple way, just tap. I let go. It's fine. Or don't get caught. Just be so much better that you don't get caught. I mean, so there's nothing to, like, 
There's no worry for me because I know I'm good enough. And and like I said, the worst case scenario is I get tapped. And God, the guy had to be so no big deal. 100%. So like you mentioned the bad breaking video and stuff. What got you looking at leg locks in the first place? So I first uh, he was a jiu-jitsu guy on top of I played jiu-jitsu and, jiu and stuff like that. Those days, people trained back in the old UFC days. Like, people had black jiu-jitsu, but they trained Sambo, you know, the Machado, the, the Hegan Machados and guys like that. They would jump into uh, Sambo tournaments and, and, and fight those guys, and they would win. Um, and uh, he started showing me heel hooks. I don't know how, but I just started loving straight ankle locks. And then and then I started like noticing that you're not supposed to tap the straight ankle lock. It's like this 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 thing that's like, oh yeah, dude, you don't tap the straight ankle lock. So I'm like, well, well, I got good in tapping, you know, because you're just not supposed to. Like at a black belt level, like, eh, hey, you should be able to eat that. You know? like, I'm gonna make it where people can't eat it. Like it's gonna do physical damage. And, Again, this is where we start talking about uh, what is the point, point of the submission, and uh, it's it's breaking mechanics. Um, even in self defense, I feel like your your objective is to injure or to subdue the threat, and uh, yeah, that's that's how you subdue something is you break its leg or you choke it unconscious or you break its arm or wrist or, you know, you injure it to the point where it doesn't want to fight anymore. Humans quit faster than animals normally, but there's people out there that I've popped their feet and, you know, they don't, the Meow Twins grab a foot on them and they're just like, eh, let it break. I don't give a shit. And they break and yep. they come back and choke you unconscious. Dude, I mean, they just don't give a shit. They're not going to quit, you know? So, you know, it's one of those things. It's it's crazy. It's fun, though. Uh, so, well, in your opinion, do you think you know IBJJF just announced that heel hooks are getting ready to be legal for the upper belts? Do you right. think it's going to change anything for them? Uh, I, I I hope I hope that the refs are well educated. I haven't exactly looked at the rule set of how to do it, which I need to because uh, I'm doing the Dallas Open for Nogi. Um, so awesome. I should probably learn the rules. <laughs> uh, so I know reaping is allowed, right, and heel hooks are allowed. Um, I wanted to see what their thoughts on Z-locks were and all that other stuff, um, but I haven't looked yet. But I just know that they've, they've, they've legalized reaping and heel hooks. Um, what is it going to change for them? In what aspect? Do you mean, will more people compete? Well, will more people compete? And do you think that the guys who primarily compete, because there are guys who do compete absolutely. in IBJJF absolutely. to avoid them? The, absolutely, absolutely not. The IBJJF guys still win the other tournaments too. The Kynons, the the Lucas Barbosas, the Atos people, they they still win. Whether they, they, I mean, Gaval, you know, all these guys, you know, these guys still win. Like the Gordons, uh, not the Gordon, but the the ADCC this year, there was like how many Atos guys that won? And 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 same with John Danaher's squad, you know? There's like five or six of on both sides, you know? Right. I kind of put that argument to like, uh, because if you go, well, there's – I, I'm not going to use any names, but there's Johnny over here that wins every Naga by Hill Hook. That dude's going to go to IBJJ and gets fucking smashed. It's just level of competition, you know? You can't come to a world-class tournament. Like, this is why I think people need to train or not train, but need to compete IBJJF more. People are like, oh, fuck IBJJF, but it's like it's the most prestigious thing out there, you know? Next to what ADCC, right? Now, now we have super fights like Fight to Win and Kasai and those other things. But honestly, dude, if you want to compete and you want to get good, 
what has more tournaments and a quality of competition. If you're like, I remember like being a brown belt going to uh, Pan Am and having to fight Yuri Simone, another guy who's won ABCC, but is what? He's an IBJJF guy. You know? He was never a kill hook guy. He was never a leg lock guy. He's a positional guy. And those positional guys win a lot because they don't get in that position. They know how to control every spot that they're getting into. So I don't think we're going to see a changing of crowns. I know Gordon's probably not going to do IBG just then because there's no money in it. And I think that's right. for trying to make it. Like, I don't get paid. I'm like, you don't get paid to do Naga either, bro. Like, I ain't paid to do Naga. Like, now, now, so now we, we, we'll kind of find out, though. We'll be like, okay, well, now there's no excuse. Like, you're not getting paid to do Naga. Now you can do heel hooks at Black Bone and Brown Belt. What's your excuse? Let's go. Run it. There's no excuse now. Like either either you're gonna you're gonna jump into the big pond. But let me tell you something. Like I get guys like Joe Gabriel Hosha, Felipe Pena, uh, Lucas Barbosa, Kynon, Gordon, and all those guys, regardless of the rule set, you better be really good at jujitsu. Hundred percent. One no, <laughs> you better be good at jujitsu. Because if not, you're gonna get exposed. You know, that's, I think there's going to be a lot of exposure happening to some of these guys and a lot of broken hearts and like, oh shit, like that's that's what that's what competition's like, you know. Dude, the guy I fought, the guy I fought was no slouch. The guy's world champion, you know, and it's one of those things where, you know, he's an IBJF guy. Those guys are good. That guy could go to almost any other tournament, probably, always place, you know. So, I think. I think people are going to be very disappointed by thinking that something's going to change in IBJJF Jeff just because of the hooks. I can agree with that because I'm like, people are going to be expecting, like you said, changing of crowns, and they're going to be very upset when they don't just come in and just rip, run through them all. And like something you don't get at Naga. You don't get black belt work at Naga. So here's the thing if you're failing at Naga, I would rather fail at the highest level against a guy like Kanon than. What's the like? Right. I like at least I thought we should always be taught to shoot higher than what we're actually doing because then if short, it's not so bad. Like losing to the number one guy in the world, it's like oh well, you know, like that's dude. He's not. I'm not. I'm not there yet. Okay. I can. One of these guys, he's like. Stuff like that. I'm oh, sorry, Tex. So you cut out there on that last part. I was just saying there's bigger things out there than being an inaugural champion, and we should always shoot to the highest, you know, the highest part of the echelons of the game, I feel. Absolutely. So for you, what do you feel like would be the highest for you, or what are some of your goals? Um. So right now, um, I'm actually trying. I'm going to look at doing IBJJF and uh, become ranked number one at Nogi and IBJJF. Um, maybe win a world title at IBJJF now, or uh, win a a super fight to where I want to go. Anyways, so I mean, the best, the better, the super fights. You know, who's number one? Fight to win. Um, hopefully Kasai comes back. You know, they pay really well. They're a good organization. I love the owner, Rich. Um, so 
yeah, I, I really have some aspirations of doing really well against the top level opponents. Uh, I guess I'll have to do the trials again, probably. Um, I think that's in November or September they're looking at. November? Yes, sir. I believe it's November. Okay, November in New Jersey. And, uh, you know, that's a hard that's a hard thing. That's another thing. Oh, that yeah. You don't have to be ranked anywhere to jump in there. Like, dude, like, if you're not – if you're, like, if you're going to be one of these guys that's like, oh, I'm going to be really good at jiu-jitsu and you want to focus on Nogi, if you're not at least putting your name in the hat because you're scared, then you should just quit. Like, this is another thing I tell people. Like, I don't know how many black belts I rolled with that I'm like, they're rolling me, they're scared. I'm like, dude, you're a black belt. Like, you carry yourself like a pussy, not a black <laughs> belt. Like, black belts don't act like this. You're not a black belt. I'm so sorry, but there has been some belts handed out. This mentality is, like, bullshit to me. Like, I'm not saying you have to be the most savage guy in the room, but, man, like, one of the things you got to be able to do is know that you should be able to fucking defend yourself. You're going to get tapped. That's why we get tapped and trained, right? But to act scared, I can't stand that. That No, that shit's not cool. You're a black belt. Don't act like that. Don't act like that when you roll with me because I'll stop rolling with you. I'm just like, dude, we're done. I'm, I'm done. I can roll with someone. What, what's the point of me rolling with you? You obviously don't want to roll. What's the point? So, Yeah. I can feel that, man. It's, it makes it a lot less fun, I'm sure, when people don't want to engage. I bet Joe gets that a lot, right, when he's training. Oh, um, not so much here, but now, like, if he goes other places, uh, a little bit, a little bit. People kind of avoid him, but that, I feel like they think they're he's meaner when he trains than what he really is. Like, he gives people a chance to tap. Man, there's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing. To, I'll give you a chance to tap. I mean, but you just got to tap. Don't let your right. Ego- broken because my job is not to let go my job is to actually finish i i and that's another thing where we're going with this this whole like i think people will say that a lot of and this is one of the things that i learned like like sometimes it's okay to let go of something in training and let like move on to your b game or something else but then again like then you're not sharpening your a game enough you're not you're not doing yourself justice by tapping them. And you're not doing them justice. You know, like letting go of a submission on people doesn't make them any better at jujitsu. And this is one thing that I've seen is where people will be like, Oh, I'm gonna go train with um, the blue belt over there. And they play they just play like, oh, like they're not really doing jujitsu, they're not like and I'm like, Well, you're not making them any better. Right. Like, Got it. They actually have to train hard to get better. Like you have to beat them up a little bit to get better. They actually have to fight to get better. And again, this goes back to becoming becoming uncomfortable to be better. Where people like will be like, oh well, that guy, that guy's uh, that guy's a black belt, and I'm a blue belt, and he gave me a hard round, so I don't want to roll with anymore. Bro, I live, I live for hard rounds where people beat the shit out of me. I live for it now, you know, because. There's going to be one day where, like, I won't be even able to, like, function at that capacity. So now at least I can have fun and function there. You know what I mean? But one day, all this is going to be done. You know, you're going to be in your 50s, hopefully having an academy with a successful, you know, student pool and teaching them and making them world champions. You know, I used to watch Jacare roll with all the world champions. He was 60. This is Jacare at Jog- 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 Alliance would roll with Cabrinha, Lucas Lepri, Leon Nogueira, Bruno, Bruno Faza, all those guys. He just, and he, I was like, man, I strive to be like that. Like, be able to, like, train with world champions when I'm that age, you know? It's a good, it's a, it's a good, uh, good place to go, I think. I think that's one of my major goals is, like, even when I'm old, and I'm not like with the young bucks, I still want to be able to get in there and go, okay, all right, well, let's do this. You know, fuck it. If I have to tap 30 times, it doesn't matter. I'll do it. You know, hundred percent, dude, that'd be awesome to be in that great of shape. Just still hop on the mask. Like, fuck it. Let's do it. <laughs> right. Dr. Ray, man. I mean, 
I don't think people know that about Jacare. Like, I think a lot of people are like, oh, Alliance. But Jacare trains, like, or used to. I don't think he, I think he retired now, but he's like 70 something. But when he was like in his 60s, when I met him, and you'd see him walk on the mat, he'd do his warm ups, yoga stretches, and shit. And then, like, first round, he'd be like, Lucas, he'd t- call Lucas the role and he'd be like, oh, fuck. I'm like, all right. <laughs> Yeah, you're picking the hardest guy on the mat already, you know? And then he'd go from there. So he'd pick the hardest guy first, and then he'd go down from there, you know? That's awesome. Um, Tex, I think that's all I got for you today, man. It was great to talk to you. I loved getting inside your mind a little bit and hearing yeah, some of your mentalities. You. Yeah, it was awesome. Awesome. Um, Before we head off, do you got anyone you want to give shout-outs to or anything? Uh. I thank my sponsors, Moses, Kimonos. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Fight Sports Miami, Cyborg, and all the guys down there for all the great training. Um, 10th Planet Atlanta for letting me become part of their community and train with them while I'm here in Atlanta while I can. Um, also, all the other teams in Atlanta that let me train with them while I'm here. And that's about it, man. Thank you for having me on. It's always been great knowing you and Joe, like seeing you guys around and just like now finally getting to talk to you. Um, <laughs> oh, um, yeah, it was nice. Thank you. Absolutely, man. It's always a pleasure being around you. You're fun to talk with and be around in general. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Absolutely. Have a good day, Tex. You too.